ผมเราเนี่ยสกิออนอิมพัลซ์กราวิเทชันเวฟส์ดัฟเฟอร์มอสลูกออนแบล็กโฮลอิน
serious. And so if you do put the effort in to uh, learn in the formalism, there is a very big payoff. You have access to uh, all these works which describe quite an array of, uh, of different problems. So, okay, let me now try and explain what the double knot page is. So we begin with uh, a space time. And double null gauge is a coordinate system in which the metric takes the full control. So, double null gauge means a coordinate system in which the metric takes this form. So, uh, there's some asymmetry, which I'll explain in a moment. So, this, if a metric takes this form, then it means that the level hypersurfaces of these functions u and v are null with respect to g. So the level hypersurfaces of U will denote CU. The level hypersurfaces of D will denote C bar V. And these are null with respect to G. And they intersect in space like two spheres. On which theta one and theta two are formed. So the picture is something like this. So we have some outgoing cone like this. And this outgoing cone will be a level hypersurface of U. And we'll have incoming cones like this. The incoming cones are level like the surfaces of B, and the intersect of these two spheres, S, U, V. Okay, and we'll have the whole ocean of the space time by, by the level like the surfaces of U and the level like the surfaces of B. Okay, so here. Omega is a function. This B is a, a vector field which is tangential to each of these spheres of intersection. So I'll call that an SUV vector field. And G slash is the induced metric on the space vector space. Which is Riemannian. So the reason for this asymmetry, so this also means that the, um, the, the angular coordinates, theta one, theta two, are transported along the Null generators of these incoming null codes. So one could have also could also have considered this where you replace B here by U, and then the metric would still be in double null form, but the uh, the the angular coordinates would then be transported along the generators of the outgoing codes rather than the incoming codes. So um, any metric can locally be put into this double null form. And uh, Schwarzschild, the exterior of Schwarzschild can be globally put into this double form. Modulo, of course, the fact that 
S2 needs to complement your antecedent to look at the module of the generation. The Schwarzschild exterior can be globally covered by a, a double log page. And the canonical gauge is called the edit of inputs. So in these coordinates, so one can arrive at this UV from the, the more familiar TR expression for Schwarzschild, which I wrote down yesterday, by setting U is T minus R star. Is T plus R star, and R star is this rigid with a coordinate. Okay, and then in this Edith and Finkelstein UV double null gauge, the Schwarzschild metric takes this. Where gamma is the uh, unit round metric. Gamma is the unit round metric of S2. So here R, you can express, you can write R implicitly as a function of U. So think of R as just some function of U. So this is in this double null form where. Omega squared, so so quantities with respect to Schwarzschild in this canonical Eddington Finkelstein double null gauge are right with a, a circle as a superscript. So omega squared is one minus two m over r. B is zero, and g slash is the round metric of radius r. And then uh, they cover the exterior region where R is strictly bigger than two M. And we can also formally parameterize the apparatus by U equal to infinity. So this is this coordinate system breaks down when uh, R is two M, but formally we can think of U equals infinity as parameterizing the event horizon. So the pitch is something like this. So V goes to infinity in this direction and to minus infinity in this direction, and U goes to infinity in the event horizon. Minus infinity in this direction. So, as I say, this is not a uh, uh, this is not a global double null gauge for the entire Schwarzschild manifold, only for the exterior. There is also a related crystal double null gauge. Which uh, does cover the entire Schwarzschild manifold, but uh, in a different form. Let me also note that Kerr can be put into double null form. However, that's a lot more complicated. So this was done in a Paper of Pretorius and this way. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. So, one thing about double null, and this is a theme which is going to be recurring for the rest of the, the lectures, is there is this huge amount of 
residual double null freedom. So this Edinson Finkelstein double null gauge, in some sense in Schwarzschild, it's canonical, but it's far from the only way to write Schwarzschild in uh, in this uh, in this double null form. So. So there's an entire, in any space time, there's an entire infinite dimensional family of diffeomorphisms. Which preserve the total form of the metric. And so, for example, I mean, the easiest way to is parameterize this double null freedom. So, suppose we have a space time and we would like to find a double null gauge in that space time. The first thing we get to do is choose some sphere to begin with. And we get to choose this sphere however we like. Okay, so choosing a sphere already, that's an entire infinite dimensional um, degree of freedom we have. Okay, we have an entire infinite dimensional degree of freedom in choosing a space like two sphere. Once we've chosen a space like two sphere, we can look at the causal future of this. And the boundary of the causal future is going to be uh, is going to consist of an outgoing non vacuum surface, which will be C0, and an incoming non vacuum surface. So the sphere determines these two null hypersurfaces. The next thing we get to choose is speeds at which these null hypersurfaces are, are, are polluted by spheres. And again, this is another infinite degree of freedom. And similarly, we choose speeds at which the uh, incoming hypersurface is foliated by spheres. Once we've done that, we can do the same thing for, for these spheres. So we can look at the causal future. The boundary of the causal future is going to consist of this outgoing null cone, again, that we began with, but now also this incoming null cone. Okay, so this incoming null cone is going to be another level hypersurface of B. And then we can also look at the uh, one of the spheres of the foliation of the incoming cone. And we do the same thing. We look at the, the boundary of its causal future. It will consist of this incoming cone that we began with again. And now there'll be a, an outgoing cone like this. So we get to choose the sphere and foliations of the two cones, and then we, we get a, uh, a double null gauge, space type double null gauge. So as I say, in Schwarzschild, the Eddington Finkelstein one, you should think is the canonical one. However, this is far from the only way to, to choose it. One can follow this procedure in, in Schwarzschild. And most of the time, we'll get a metric in a form which is unrecognizable. Okay, so. Uh, the Eddington Finkelstein is the is the is the is the good double null gauge which we, which we recognize. Now, this is relevant for the following reason. So, we're going to be considering solutions which converge to Schwarzschild. We would like the solutions not only to converge to Schwarzschild but to converge to Schwarzschild in this Eddington Finkelstein double null gauge so that we can indeed recognize them as, as Schwarzschild. So one of the difficulties in the, in the problem, and this actually features already in the um, linear stability of Schwarzschild, which I'll, I'll discuss today, 
in order to make the space time converge to Schwarzschild in this double null gauge, one cannot normalize it initially, one cannot normalize this residual freedom initially, one has to normalize it to the future in a way which depends on how the solution behaves in evolution. Okay, so to explain that a bit further, suppose you chose this initial sphere to be as nice as it possibly could be. So if the space-time is Schwarzschild itself, then choosing this sphere to be as nice as it possibly could be would mean choosing it to be one of the spheres of symmetry. Okay, then in Schwarzschild itself, as long as you choose these foliations sensibly, all of the spheres will then look nice. Okay, so in particular, this sphere up here to the future, this will also be one of the spheres of symmetry. But that fact is very, very special to Schwarzschild. So as soon as you have a space time which is not Schwarzschild, but is merely convergent to Schwarzschild at some rate, in general, there'll be some curvature present, there'll be some gravitational radiation present. And if you choose this sphere to be as nice as it possibly could be, that curvature will distort these spheres in, when you follow this process. And then this sphere up here to the future will not look so nice. So if you want this sphere to look nice, the thing to do is to choose this sphere to the future and not this sphere initially. Or to say that slightly differently, to make this sphere look nice, one should choose this sphere not to be as nice as possible, but one should choose it in a way which is informed by how the space-time is going to behave in evolution so that it interacts exactly nice, so that it interacts nicely with that radiation to make this one uh, be as nice as possible. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, going to be a, a, a recurring a recurring thing. When you say choosing to be nice, yeah. you also mean choosing the space. Nice. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And in short shield, if you just perturb the sphere yeah. and look at I mean, do what happens if it goes? If you perturb this sphere and then yeah, in short make shield. the in short shield itself, make these curve the speed. Yeah. Yes then towards the future, it's not going to look like the editing thing. Like these spheres would not look right. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, so that's a double null gauge. So associated to any double null gauge is a double null frame. So once we have a double null gauge, we can define this frame. So EA is D by D theta A. E3 is one over omega times D by D U. And E4 is one over omega times D by D V plus this vector P. So you can check with the metric defined like I had before. This is a double null frame, so E3 and E4 are both null vectors. They're both orthogonal to these um, space like vectors. E3 and E4 are normalized about in a product from that. So on the picture, they look something like this. So E1 and E2 are always tangential to these spheres of intersection. E4 points in this outgoing null direction, and E3 points in this incoming null direction. And in order to capture the geometric content of the Einstein equations in a nice way, when we study Einstein equations in double null gauge, the unknowns that we consider are not only the, the metric components, we also consider the, the Rishi coefficients of the metric with respect to this double null frame and the curvature components of this frame. So there's some standard notation which we use, which I'll introduce, but you do not need to remember this standard notation. So the Rishi coefficients of this frame 
a toto je slovo po chaj, chaj je bej, so chaj is the, if you take these spheres and consider them as a submanifold of the outgoing null cone, chaj is the second fundamental form of that sphere. Similarly, chaj bar is the second fundamental form of that sphere considered now as a submanifold of the incoming cone. And one can write down the rest of the Rishi coefficients we used to call them to the bar. Mega bar. And one can also consider the curvature components. And the notation for these are oh, and we also we also decompose chi chi and chi bar into their trace and trace free parts. So trace i and the, uh, the trace of chi with respect to the induced metric on these spheres, and chi bar is defined to be the trace free part. So similarly for chi bar. So the curvature components, I'll just write down alpha, which is defined by inserting the maximal number of E4 vectors that you have. So the maximal number of outgoing vectors, the curvature tensor. And similarly, alpha bar, uh, incoming vectors. Spheres, then the rest we call beta, beta bar, rho, and delta. So, of course, you don't have to remember these. It is helpful to just remember that alpha and alpha bar are components of the curvature tensor because alpha and alpha bar are about to feature prominently. But these are all of the Rishi coefficients and curvature components of this double mold frame, I guess, plus the um, the, the, the Christopher symbols on, on S2 on this sphere. So beta rho sigma are also other curvature. There are other curvature. So what, what are eta and omega? Uh, these are also Rishi coefficients. What is Rishi coefficient? Uh, Christopher symbols. Oh, okay. They call them Rishi coefficients when it's a frame rather than a quarter of the flow process. Uh, okay. So for example, if you take Schwarzschild in that Eddington Finkelstein double null gauge, then most of the Rishi coefficients and curvature components vanish. The only ones which don't vanish are trace chi, which it's convenient to write it with this omega factor. And I'll write this circle to denote the the, the, the quantities in Schwarzschild in this canonical page. So trace chi looks like this. Trace chi bar. Uh, again, it's convenient to wait it. The negative of the other Rishi coefficients vanish, and there's only one non vanishing component of the curvature tensor, which is this component rho. Okay, and then of course one can also write down per in the double gauge. That's a bit more complicated. So I'm not going to do that. Okay, what's the zero subscript? Uh, zero, I just used to denote the Schwarzschild oh. quantities in this bridge. I'm about to linearize the equation to run Schwarzschild. So. So 
So these now, these objects, are the unknowns that we consider in the Einstein equations, and the equations, uh, the Yankee and structure. So the analytic content of the vacuum Einstein equations is, is contained in these equations satisfied by the Rishi coefficients and curvature coefficients. So the, the, the components of these relations, the null components of these uh, structure equations, So if we insert x, y, and z to be the um, uh, components of the null frame, then these relations will give us relations between the Rishi coefficients and the curvature components. And these we call the structure of the Examples are so I guess this one would arise from putting uh, y equals e a, z equals e4, and x equals e4. And then the first term in this will look like some e4 derivative of uh, of, uh, of chi hat. Which is not like EA. So, one of the relations when you're at the output is like this. And again, you don't have to have a straight The curvature component, which will appear in that case, is uh, alpha. Okay, so here this nabla slash four means some sort of projection. Of space time covariant derivative in the uh, in the equal direction in that output direction. So this is one of the equations, and this we view as a transport equation for chi hat. If you think of alpha is given, then this is a uh, an equation, a transport equation for chi hat in that outgoing north direction. Another of these relations looks like this. So exactly what it is, don't worry too much about so Nablus slash, this is the covariant derivative of the metric G slash on S2. And this is the divergence of that metric. So we view chi hat as a symmetric uh, traceless zero two tensor on the spheres of intersection of the double bulk gauge. And this is the divergence of this object. And one sees derivatives of other Rishi coefficients, curvature components, and terms which are nonlinear in, in Rishi coefficients. And this equation, you should think of as an um, elliptic equation. Or uh, if you view the right hand side as given, one can think of this as an elliptic equation for, for chi, chi R. So then. One can view, and then this system is one of the few black boards to write down the whole system. These you should view as equations for the Rishi coefficients, and they couple to the components of the curvature tensor. The components of the curvature tensor satisfy a system of Bianchi equations. 
So recall that if we look at in a general space time, if we look at the uh, divergence of the Riemann curvature tensor, then by the Bianchi identities, by the second Bianchi identities, one can relate this to the gradient of the Rishi curvature. And it looks like this. And okay, if G solves the vacuum Einstein equations, then these are equals. Okay, so the, the, the Bianchi equations satisfied by the um, curvature components are the relations, um, are the components of this relation. Divergence of Riemann tensor is, is vanishing. So one rewrites this space-time covariant derivative in terms of derivatives tangential to the spheres. And one gets a system of equations for the curvature components, which involve the Rishi coefficients. So for example, one of these relations gives an equation that alpha looks like this equals beta and Rishi coefficients. And beta, which involves divergence of alpha, uh, is let's say Swedish coefficients. So, again, here this is the space time covariant derivative in that outgoing direction uh, projected, and this is a space time derivative in this uh, incremental direction projected. This operator is. Um, uh, well, first, this is the divergence of uh, um, the metric G slash on the spheres. This is the Bebyshevika connection of the metric G slash. This funny operator takes a one form beta and takes it to a so it's the symmetric trace free gradient of the one form of beta. So again, you don't need to look so hard, but um, you should think that this is a system of hyperbolic equations for the Okay, so the, the hyperbolic content of the vacuum Einstein equations is captured in this system of Bianchi equations. So let me just very briefly show you why you should think that this is a, a hyperbolic system. The idea is that this operator, this operator is the formal L2 adjoint of this divergence operator. Therefore, there's an energy estimate for this system. So, for example, and let's just look on Minkowski space. So, if one looks at by the U of alpha squared and adds d by the V of beta squared, d by the U of alpha squared looks like alpha. Output three of alpha and d by dv of beta looks like uh, beta contracted with map of four beta times two. We can insert these two equations for these things. So we get alpha contracted with 3 minus two times alpha d 
contracted with this symmetric trace free gradient with beta. And we get plus two times beta contracted with the divergence of alpha. Plus some of these other terms involving Russian coefficients. And this is the formal of L2 adjoint of this, meaning that this term is actually a complete divergence. So this is two times the divergence of alpha times beta. So then if one takes this relation, it integrates it over a, a, a space-time region like this. And one gets an energy identity. So when one integrates over this space time region, then this divergence term is going to vanish, and these will just give rise to boundary terms. So one gets something like this. Okay, so this is the type of energy estimate one has for a hyperbolic collision. So yeah, this is a hyperbolic system. So the statement is that any tensors alpha and beta that satisfy this equation above on Minkowski space will satisfy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So of course, in general, it's, the background is also very different. So, but in general, they have an energy estimate. So it's just a little bit simpler on Minkowski space. Okay, so we have transport equations, elliptic equations, and hyperbolic equations. So that's Einstein equations in double null gauge. As I say, it would take um, several blackboards to write down the equations in full, so let me not do that. Let me draw straight to the problem of linear stability. Actually, maybe this is a good point to take a break, and then we can resume in five minutes with this. Okay, so linear stability of Schwarzschild involves linearizing the um, system of Bianchi and structure equations around Schwarzschild in that canonical Eddington Finkelstein double null gauge and uh, showing that solutions are bounded and decay in time. So it's, it's, I mean, one can try to formulate this more abstractly. It's a lot less clean to formulate than the four months linear problem, which we discussed yesterday. But let me just go directly to the formulation in the double null gauge. So one takes these equations in double null gauge, Einstein equations, in double null gauge. Meaning this system of Bianchi and structure equations. Linearize around S. And the problem is to show boundedness and decay for solutions of that respective system. So for the rest of today, let's talk about uh, theorem of thermophysical and radiation. Okay, 
updated in 2016. Um, the first version of this theorem is Schwarzschild's theory. It's more precisely in the book. So there's some new difficulties in this compared to all my problems that we discussed yet. Actually, all of those difficulties that we saw yesterday in this poor man's linear stability problem, they feature in this full linear stability problem. In addition, there's some further complications. So the first is there are families of solutions to this linearized system, which I'll uh, show you in a moment, which do not decay. Two families. The first arises from the fact that there are nearby members of the Kerr family there. Kerr is stationary. They give rise to a family of solutions of the linearized equations, which do not decay. The second family is um, uh, arises from this uh, large amount of residual double mode freedom, which we just discussed. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll write them down. In the second difficulty is that the, the decoupled wave equation, which um, most naturally arises, it actually can't be directly understood using the methods we discussed yesterday. It looks, um, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a bit more difficult to do. So the third difficulty is Okay, so first I'll tell you how you linearize the equations, then I'll tell you about these families, then I'll state the theorem more precisely, and then I'll outline the proof. So to linearize the equations, we could consider a, a one parameter family of metrics in double null form, which begin with Schwarzschild. Expand around Schwarzschild. So we, when I say you consider a one parameter family of metrics, you can think this is equivalent to considering a, a one parameter family of functions big omega, a one parameter family of functions B, and the one parameter, sorry, a one parameter family of vector fields V, and the one parameter family of Riemannian metrics on S2, G slash. Once we have such a one parameter family, then we have a one parameter family of double null frames. So therefore, we have a one parameter family of all of the Rishi coefficients, such as trace chi, and it's convenient to weight trace chi with this omega factor and all the rest of them. So then we tailor expand these around Schwarzschild. So remember, omega in Schwarzschild was equal to the square root of one minus two m over r. Then we the, the, the linear term in epsilon we denote with a one like this. Finally, B and Schwarzschild vanished. Schwarzschild in the canonical case vanished. 
for their excellent um, G slash and Schwarzschild was the round metric of radius R. Trace chi was uh, over R times one minus two over R. So then, once inserts this, yeah. Uh, so when I say perturb the metric, when I say look at a one parameter family of metrics in double null form, I just mean look at a one parameter family of omega, one parameter family of B, and a one parameter family of G slash. Yeah, no, no. So that component's always zero. Because remember, we can always put a metric into the double null form. So when I say a one parameter family of metrics in double null form, I mean uh, uh, a one parameter family of omega b and g slash. Yeah, exactly. So the, I mean, this is just a question of how you identify two different two different space types, right? We I'm just saying we identify them just by the values of those coordinates. So then one can put uh, these into the system of structure of Bianchi equations to zeroth order in epsilon. Uh, everything will cancel exactly because Schwarzschild is a solution. Schwarzschild is a solution of the Einstein equations, therefore all these zeroth order terms will vanish. And then we just consider the, the terms to order epsilon, and we call that the system, the, the linear system. We ignore everything to order epsilon squared. One example was this earlier for Kai Ha. Okay, so now here, this remember the things with the circle did not the Schwarzschild background. So this is the linearization of that equation that I showed you earlier. It's actually, it only involves chi hat, linearized chi hat, and linearized alpha. So if you think of linearized alpha as something known, then uh, one views that as an inhomogeneous transport equation for, for chi hat, the linearized function of chi hat. So again, the whole system is, is huge. Uh, I'll just call this system LG, which stands for linearized gravity. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So all of the objects are now uh, tensor fields on the Schwarzschild background, and all of these derivative operators are defined with respect to the Schwarzschild background. And uh, the list that you wrote here would continue and just include everything. So all the Ricci, all the curvature. Absolutely. So the Ricci coefficients and the curvature coefficients are, are determined, but for the purpose of analysis, you're going to treat them. As exactly. Unknown. Exactly. Just because it's a lot, one captures the geometric structure of the equations a lot better. So curvature components are much better than the typical second derivative. Of
Okay, so the system is huge, as I say, but we can immediately infer the existence of two special families of solutions to the system. So the first is the family of residual QH solutions. And this family arises exactly because at the nonlinear level, we had that huge amount of residual double, double null freedom. It was that infinite dimensional family of diffeomorphisms which preserved the double null form of the metric. Good question. The system of uh, linearized equations, uh, ge generally speaking, are they, are, they, are they any better or any worse than, than what we started before? Well, they're they're linear. So they were not linear before. No, sure, but are there like any surprises that occur or like uh, things that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, wait one moment. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So, one family of solutions is residual QH solutions. So, any change of that residual double null freedom will give rise to a, a, a family of solutions. So for example, if we consider a change of coordinates, u epsilon, which is um, the old u plus epsilon times function in theta, v, the old v plus epsilon times other function of theta, and similarly for the theta. Then, as long as this change preserves the double null form of the metric to linear order, this will be a solution of the, the system. So it turns out that to ensure that this preserves the double null form to linear order, we just have to um, uh, say this one does not depend on V, and this one does not depend on U, and then the change will preserve the double null form to linear order. So for any functions F3, which just depends on u and theta. I call it F3 just because remember the E3 component of the frame is d by dq. And this one, F4, which only depends on v, and this looks like the uh, uh, E4 component, which was with the frame is d by dv. So for any functions, the following quantities, and these arise by uh, taking a change like this and seeing how these objects change under that, under that change of coordinates. So I'll just show you some again. So if you take omega to look like this, V you take to look like this. This kind this. So I'll change. This is a system of the linearized equations. And note that this is an infinite dimensional family.
precisely because the um, residual double null freedom that we had at the nonlinear level was in dimensional. So the second family is the family of linearized Kerr solutions. And this arises from the presence of the Kerr family there at the moment. This one is a lot simpler, so I can actually write this one. So the M in R will make it to be minus a half of M slash the minus two M times the round metric the, the capital M here now, which was the Schwarzschild that we literally raised, and then there's this lip M. And so okay. So if you take this and then everything else is zero, then um, this is a solution of the, the linearized system. All that uh, linearized. So this is a one parameter family, a one dimensional family of solutions. And you should think it arises because there are other members of Schwarzschild with different masses nearby at the nonlinear level. The second, it's a three dimensional family. So if we take any, well, and this is a spherically symmetric solution as well. So if we take any three functions, a minus one, a zero, a one. Um, this one's a little bit more complicated. So one metric. One of the components sigma. So we sum the corresponding a minus six divided by r to the four times the three. L equals one spherical harmonics. So these are the standard L equals one spherical harmonics on this two. So beta and eta Everything else is zero. Um, this is a family of solutions called linearized curve. So, Martin, um, so the, the right hand side of the board, uh, you right, you you've um, you've listed all those quantities which are the same as you know all, all the quantities that you expect to appear at the linear right when you linearize. But the on the left, you 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 have a proposition. Uh, you've only listed down three terms, but is that just because you've omitted all the other ones, or is or is it just somehow special? The other ones are zero for this. Oh, oh, for this, yeah. uh, right? So that's all you need. Okay. So for these ones, everything's non-zero except for alpha. And alpha. These are the two linearized curvature components. So we'll come back to this observation in a moment. Here, most of them are zero. These okay. are the only three non-zero ones, and these ones here are the only non-zero ones for linearized curve. Everything else is zero. So this is, I didn't write these ones down, but this one is supported on um, L equals one. But omega G bar those are No, these are the only zero ones. I mean, so you should you should think that it um At the nonlinear level, the metric will look like the Schwarzschild metric in Eddington Finkelstein double null plus these quantities. 
So it's the linearized parts which are. Uh, right, so this one is curvature. These two are curvature. These two are oh, it's the B. Rishi coefficients okay, of B. So it's just the B. Yeah. It's just the B that changes in the metric. So altogether, this is a four-dimensional family. So this is one-dimensional, and this is three-dimensional. Remember, um, you should think that Kerr is a four-dimensional family when we parameterize our Schwarzschild, because to describe a nearby member of Kerr, if we're in Schwarzschild, we want to describe a nearby member of Kerr. We not only need mass and angular momentum parameters, but we also need an axis of uh, rotation, which we described. So the axis together with the mass and the angular momentum parameters are, are, are four parameters. So that's why this is a four dimension. So, okay, there are these two families and the stability theorem. More precisely, be stated as follows. So for all the initial normalized data for the linear hypothesis equations, initial normalized, so that it's just like this. So we have the Schwarzschild exterior, and we consider initial data on these two null hypersurfaces. It's uh, it's slightly more convenient to consider these. Transversely intersected null hypersurfaces rather than simply space link. So, this residual double null freedom is normalized to these initial hypersurfaces. Then, for every solution, for, for all, um, for any such data, the solution is bounded. Exterior. And the second point is that it decays to a member of the linearized curve family, but it decays only after we normalize this residual double hole freedom. So, in other words, it decays to a member of linearized curve plus a member of the residual double hole. So I'll call. I'll just call these pure gauge solutions. So after adding a pure gauge solution, phase to a member of linear rest curve. That's an inverse polynomial rate. And finally, this. Uh, pure gauge solution that one has to add. This is also bounded by the initial data. So what's the, what does all initial normalized data for LG mean? So remember that um, we had this picture earlier of these initial hypersurfaces. So this initial sphere and its initial hypersurfaces. Initial normalized means that they're chosen nicely. So for example, one might normalize the foliations of the cones in such a way as to be affine. So that big omega linear mass vanishes them. Something like this. This renormalization is going to happen in a way which depends on how the solution behaves in evolution. So that brings us nicely to the following. So there's a so there's a few there are difficulties which. Um, There are difficulties in the nonlinear problem, which actually feature already here. And this change of gauge is one of them. There's also some facts about this linearized theorem, which um, 
is a bit simpler and uh, the, some of the nonlinear difficulties are uh, related to these things. So let me maybe explain those briefly and then I'll end by just outlining, outlining how the, the proof of this, this theory works. Are there any other questions? So the, so the, sorry. <laughs> so the residual gauge, you never actually like gauge fix it away. It's just you're gonna just gonna make what you account for it. Yeah. Right. So it is gauge fixed, but it is gauge fixed in a way which depends on how the solution behaves in evolution. So you can't just begin with initial data and say, I'm going to fix the gauge like this. It it, it one has to solve first and then and then fix it depending on how how it how it's So this specific form of linear stability control shield, how how different is it to the to the other results in the literature for for this kind of state? Which results do you mean? Like the ones by Taken from Brendel or Sparty? Uh, right. So those are based on a generalized harmonic gauge. They're not based on double null. They're based on harmonic gauge. And some of them, uh, uh, well, you know, Kleinem and Schiffel. So Kleinem and Schiffel is an, um, they never wrote something about linear, the linearized problem. Sure. You can infer something given uh, the nonlinear theory. But it is, is this in some sense like the best statement you could get? Because this is the best statement. Because in a way, there's, there's no restriction at all on the initial data. It just, well, other than the initial normalized. Uh, there's, there's no restriction on the initial data. So uh, one can always achieve, given any data, one can achieve this initial normalization by adding a pure gauge solution to it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's completely free of, of any kind of restrictive thing yeah and so maybe it's worth also remarking as well that i mean the boundedness statements they're really um, they don't lose derivatives so you have a boundedness of let's say 10 derivatives of solu the solution by 10 derivatives of data the um uh which makes going from this to the non-linear problem a lot easier so that type of statement is uh it is is uh very helpful for the novel new problem. This statement that the change of gauge one has to make is bounded by data. This also is very important for the nonlinear problem. And so the analog of the nonlinear analog of this statement we'll see tomorrow when I talk about the, the nonlinear theory. Something that I uh, wondered about as well is um, so the Initial data for this problem has to be close, right? In in so well, these equations are linear. So in the nonlinear problem, they have to be close to Schwarzschild, but uh, this is a linear system. So isn't, if you understand small solutions, you also understand large solutions. Right, but sure. But what I was what I was going to ask was suppose that I wanted to say that it's not just close. Where it decays to linearized curve, but I wanted more information about particular components, and that my data was only large, say, in certain directions. Is the system good enough that you can track and, and, and somehow track which components in which directions stay large? Or with the largeness of one component and all the other components, say, being small or zero, would, would is the system is the nature of the system so that actually the largeness just spreads and you can't control specifically the the components at the at the end of the right so in in the nonlinear theory if some component is large in general this will spread to everything it'll it'll seep into everything in general yeah, yeah. but of course one can construct special types of largeness which you're very familiar with and uh, uh, one could hope for such special constructions but in general, the largeness was good.
but it, but but with this one, the li at the linear level, you, you you don't get this seeping away into all the different things, or you. S so, uh, again, though, so linear. If you understand large, if you understand small solutions, you understand large solutions as well. Yes. But I think. But do you do you get like do you are you able to track like the components? So you mean if you begin with some data small and some data large? Yeah, yeah. Does, the, does it remain in, that in, way? In general, no. In general, okay. In general, no. In general. Okay. But it depends a bit. So actually, the linearized equations you should think decouple in some sense. So there's a hierarchy, and so it depends which ones in the hierarchy are where in the hierarchy. Right. So we'll come to this. Uh, and this is one of the special things about the linear equations, which you lost about the complete. And the gauge. Uh, so this this idea that this number two in your theorem, uh, yeah. in, in the theorem, it's, it's it's as clean as it can be, right? Because it's just it's the same freedom you wrote down earlier. Do, is something like that does does that always happen to these stability works no matter the approach you have to add a gauge which depends on the evolution you have a you have to add a pure gauge which depends right. on the full evolution so this is very common for gauges like double null which have a large transport component and you should think that just because of this picture which i drew in it earlier so if you um for the typical nice initial data once you have some non-trivial radiation in the solution, it will the gauge will not look nice later on. Okay, now you can think of other gauges where things like that might not be true. So, for example, in the harmonic gauge group of um, stability in Minkowski space, there's no such normalization, renormalization of the gauge like this. There is in the original crystal Dupuy-Feynman proof, which is based on a gauge which is not so dissimilar from uh, double null gauge. But in the harmonic gauge in that stability of Minkowski space set, and there's no renormalization. Yeah. The part two of the theorem, yeah. you in some sense get to read off which linearized curve solution is most efficient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I'm right. So, that's what I wanted to say. So, um, there's in general, so to introduce a word I'm about to use a lot. In black hole stability problem, there are a lot of teleological aspects. So recall that just the definition of black hole, this was something very global or something very teleological. So we defined the black hole yesterday by saying, well, there's some sort of asymptotic boundary that one can attach to the solution called, that we call fusional infinity. And the black hole exterior is defined to be everything in the past of fusional infinity. So if you just begin with some small open set of a space time, it's impossible to say whether there's a black hole there or not. One really needs this global structure to be able to talk about black hole. So these theorems, they only ever, the, this theorem and the, the, the nonlinear theorem, which we'll discuss tomorrow, it only concerns the black hole exterior. But a priori, the black hole exterior is an unknown in the problem because one has to solve globally and then see what's in the past of this asymptotic boundary. So just that black hole notion is teleological. Moreover, the, in the nonlinear theory, the, the member of Kerr, which you decay to, is also teleological, meaning that solutions will radiate mass and angular momentum and how much mass and angular momentum they radiate determines which member of Kerr that you converge to. And in general, there is no way to know that without solving the problem and seeing how much they do. But um, there are two miracles of linear theory, which mean that those two things are not teleological in this linearized setting. They're actually explicit in terms of uh, in terms of finishing. So in linear theory, Uh, the, the linear analog of the location of the event horizon or the linearized analog of the characterization of the black hole exterior. This is um, 
this is explicit, you can explicitly determine that in terms of initial data. So when you say rotation of event horizon, well, let me put it in quotation marks because it's the linearized analog of the location of the event horizon. This is something one can explicitly determine from initial data. And this member of the linearized curve family is also something that you can read off explicitly from, from initial data. So some of the difficulties we'll discuss tomorrow in the nonlinear problem concern uh, these two issues, which are no longer true. But this issue with the gauge, this is already present. Normalization of this residual double null freedom, or in other words, the pure gauge solution, which one has to find in step two, uh, is technological. Meaning not explicitly determined from initial data, but dependent on, on how the solution behaves. So there's also a corollary of this theorem. Is this corollary? Which you should actually more directly compare to the nonlinear theorem, which I'll discuss. So the corollary says that there is a co dimension three subspace of initial data for which the solution decays not to a member of linearized curve, but to a member of this linearized Schwarzschild family. I guess this is related to Dan's question, but you can you can read off the new uh, ADM parameters of the the linearized curve that you approach. You can read that off in this linearized setting explicitly from initial data. And what what do you see? Like the mass changes by a little bit, the angular. They're, they're, they're all conservative. They're conservative. Oh. Wait, so you're you're actually decaying to a linearized curve, but with the same M as what you started? Yeah, correct. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And then in the nonlinear theory, that doesn't happen. Correct. But you can still read them off? No. no. And that's one of the difficulties. Okay. This corollary, which you should think is the linearized analog of the, the, the nonlinear theory, which is missing. But not to be the dead horse here, but the corollary is actually, you actually know the codependent. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But, but in the nonlinear, it's going to be some big. Yeah, correct. In the nonlinear theory, it's sort of characterized teleology. All right, I actually don't need so long to talk about. I can do it quickly. I can give you the short version. So the, the linearized system is huge. There's lots of um, uh, unknowns. A natural starting point is these two extreme components of the curvature tensor, uh, which are gauge and period. By gauge invariant, I mean that they don't change under a renormalization of this residual pure gauge freedom, or in other words, they vanish for every pure, for every member of that uh, family of pure gauge solutions. 
And I wrote them in that they were alt linearized alpha and linearized alpha bar. So I remember that these were the two curvature components in the Newman Penrose formalism, these are C0 and C4. Uh, this, the fact that they're gauge invariant is convenient because it means that they can be studied independently of how the, the gauge is normalized, how that residual freedom is normalized. So one doesn't have to worry about whether that um, freedom is normalized to the past or the future. So they're gauge invariant and moreover they satisfy uh, equations which decouple from the rest of the linear system. And uh, these equations are called Tchaikovsky equations. This was first noticed by Bardeen and Press in this Schwarzschild case. But this actually generalizes to Kerr, and it was noticed by the generalization to Kerr was noticed by Charles. So the equation it schematically looks like this. So it looks like wave equation for this component alpha, like we saw yesterday. There's a potential, so V is a function on M, and you should think that this is a very well behaved potential, so this looks nice. But there's also this part for the store that's on. And it schematically looks a bit like this. So this looks a lot like the equation from the four man's problem that we, the four man's linear problem that we discussed yesterday. Uh, the difference is the potential, which is good, but there's also this um, first order term, which is bad. And the presence of this first order term actually um, destroys a lot of the, uh, well, so for example, there is no known conserved energy for solutions of, of this system. So for a very long time, it was not clear how to make any statements about this linearized system beyond um, beyond statements about fixed mode solutions. So it was actually not known until this work of the Fermat's Holzik of Rodnyansky. So the key observation, and this observation actually goes back to Chandrasekhar. is that one can transform these quantities, alpha and alpha bar, into quantities which satisfy a nicer wave equation. So, the transformations are easy to write explicitly, but it's maybe more intuitive to write them schematically. So, the first transform quantity we call P, and schematically, it's obtained by taking two derivatives of alpha in this incoming null direction. Second is P bar, and it looks schematically like taking two derivatives of alpha bar in this outgoing null direction, this uh, V direction. And these two objects both satisfy so the Reggie Wheeler equation is a, a wave equation with a good potential. So it's a different V to the V here, but it's a good potential. Now it's no first order term. So this is a version of this, so a fixed frequency version of this observation. When you say the quantities schematically look like that, there's like, there's just more low order term? Or something. Yeah, so it's some, you have to put appropriate R weights and omega weights. And it's not less three and not four. Sorry, it's not less three and not four. Instead of, I mean, d by du of a 
mean, this is a zero two test. So I'm just writing it like this. Uh, okay. So it's funny. So Reggie and Wheeler were actually studying uh, linearized equations around Schwarzschild, but at the metric level. So they were not in double log gauge, they were looking at metric perturbations. And they discovered a decoupled equation, which one of the metric components satisfies. So this, it, P, it's quite a different object. So P, it, it's two derivatives of curvature, so it lives at the level of four derivatives of the metric. But it's quite remarkable that the same equation that Reggie Wheeler studied, and Reggie Wheeler, this work is from 1957. The same equation that they studied, it appears again in this form that it was transformed. Yours is also four Oh, no, no, no. Theirs is metric, zero derivatives of metric, and this is four derivatives. Yes, of metric. Oh, okay. sure. Is there any like, is, is there something at work behind the scenes here that we're not seeing, or is there something? So it's quite mysterious, actually. Still. What so, is? Sorry. Like, where did P come from? Right. So, uh, it's a bit mysterious. Okay. <laughs> it's a bit mysterious. So there are reasons why, I mean, the settings where commuting improves things. So a good example is when we talked about the redshift effect yesterday. So if you take um, the wave equation and commute it with a transverse derivative to the event horizon, then that equation is actually even more redshift. So there's a phenomenon called the amplified redshift effect. And so there is a general principle of when you start commuting, things get better. Here, okay, you commute and the equation becomes better, but it's not, it, I mean, it's, it's very good, right? The, this bad term has actually disappeared completely. So why that works up so well in Schwarzschild, that, that's part of the magic of Schwarzschild, I guess. And it's a little bit mysterious. And uh, so this was Reggie Wheeler? Chandra Sekar. Oh, no, no, no. This, sorry, this equation arose in the work of Reggie Wheeler, and it was Chandra Sekar who noticed at the level of fixed frequencies that um, you could transform objects like this into a solution of this equation. Okay. That you could transform solutions of Tchaikovsky into uh, solutions of Reggie Wheeler. So, oh, I see. Okay. But but the Fermos, Hansik, or Ronansky were the first to. They were the first to use it. They were the first. To I mean, they were first to do it in physical space. Because they were the first to find the physical space on the logs. And they were first to use it to analyze solutions of the Tchaikovsky equation. Okay. Oh. Okay, so this one can study, like we did yesterday. The methods from yesterday apply directly to this equation. This leads to polynomial decay for P, P bar, and then one can invert these relations, one can view these as transport equations for alpha, and this leads to polynomial decay for alpha and alpha bar. So that's about half of the story. The, the second half concerns the, the remainder of the system, the gauge dependent system. And I have a little bit prepared, but in the interest of time, I think I'm going to just go very quickly over this. So, um, so let's say so if alpha and alpha bar, if you view them as known, then the entire remaining system can be viewed as a system of transport and elliptic equations. So the remainder of the
And moreover, there's a hierarchical structure in this system. Meaning that it effectively decouples. So, for example, you recall this equation which I wrote down for of pi bar r. Maybe let me create a problem. So the equation for chi bar r is that price when you write the integrated factors correctly. An equation which only contains alpha bar. Okay, so if all of that huge uh, linearized system is not, none of the other unknowns are present, the only unknown which is present is alpha bar, and that's something which we can view as known already. Okay, so the, um, then there's an equation for one of the other curvature components, beta bar, and beta bar only, the equation for beta bar, it only involves chi bar hat and alpha bar, okay, and then so on. Okay, so there's this decoupling which happens in the system. So, um, yeah, maybe let me see. Oh, we're all pictures of this. So we have initial data on these two null hypersurfaces, and we view this as a transport equation Bar bar. So um, the boundedness part of the theorem follows from, well, in this initial normalized gauge, we know something about chi bar hat on this initial hypersurface. Therefore, we can integrate this equation forwards, and this will lead to a boundedness statement for chi bar hat. But of course, it won't decay in general. The solution will not decay in general. There'll be an initial data term, and there'll be some integral of uh, Alpha bar along this incommunal hypersurface. And in general, those two things will not cancel one another out. So the, the decay part of the theorem involves adding a pure gauge solution. And again, it's dependent on how the solution behaves in evolution. And it ensures that quantities like chi bar hat will decay along the event horizon. Then once one knows that they decay along the event horizon, one can go back to equations like this and integrate them not backwards now, but not forwards now, but backwards. So then there'll be two terms. There'll be a term arising from the, the, this final data, which decays, and there'll be a term involved in the integral of alpha bar from here to the event horizon, which of course also decays. So the, the, the decay part, the boundedness part goes by integrating the equations in this hierarchical manner forwards, and the boundedness, the, the decay follows from integrating hierarchically backwards after renormalizing the solution to the future. So I've already gone over, the, so I think I'll stop there for today. Questions? The hierarchy refers to this salt or alpha bar and kind of hat is the salt. Bar. Yep. And so on. So it decouples like this. So every quantity satisfies an equation which only involves previous quantities, not hierarchy. And this part of the argument where does it need Kirsch? Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about that. Correct. Okay. So this is a symmetric trace free zero two tensor. So you can view this, you should think of, you, you can think of this as like a function which is supported only on L bigger than or equal to two spherical harmonics. You can think of it as a function which has vanishing L equals zero, L equals one spherical harmonics. So this procedure, it controls the L bigger than or equal to two spherical harmonics of the remainder of the solution. L equals zero, one, that's exactly where the linearized curve found the fifth. And it turns out that by normalizing the gauge properly initially, the only thing that lives in L equals zero one is linearized curve. So then you just read off where it is initially. And that's the thing that you converged. Okay. 
So the, the L equals zero one is only gauge and curve, and it decouples completely in linear theory from the uh, the, 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 the higher the higher plane. So this this observation is just so powerful, right? I mean, it just yeah. suddenly allows you to once you have alpha and alpha bar, then you have this this hierarchy. So I'm guessing that in alternative approaches to the stability problem, th this equation doesn't, there's nothing like this that happens. I mean, this is all in the, or is there, I don't know, but is, is this really, does something like this happen elsewhere? Uh, it depends what you mean by it. Well, like, is there, so let's say like harmonic gauge or something, is there like a decoupling that happens in a similar right. kind of way? So, so that's interesting actually. So, um, so this decoupling actually generalizes the curve, right? In particular, this observation of Tchaikovsky that alpha and alpha bar satisfy these equations. As long as you define alpha and alpha bar correctly in the curve, they still satisfy a decoupling equation. So we also mentioned this work of Reggie Wheeler. And Reggie Wheeler was uh, specific to Schwarzschild. So they look at some type, some harmonic type gauge and find that decoupled quantity in Schwarzschild. Uh, and to my knowledge, no one has found the generalization of that to, to curve. Can you talk a little bit more about the, um, the bit that you said you didn't have much time in, especially the, the arrows you drew on your diagram? You just talk a little bit more about what's yeah, going on. Right. So I mean the idea is just to let's pretend the equation looks like this. Also, another quick thing was what what's V in this equation again? Uh, where is it? On in the red wheeler. This V, this potential. Oh, right, yeah, this is just some potential. It's just some function of R. But it's like some it doesn't have this one minus three M over R. Doesn't like degenerate or something at the trapping sphere or anything? Does it degenerate? I think it does not degenerate. But that would be okay. I mean, you should think that if this degeneration was faster, then this would actually be a nice equation. So the, the bad thing about this is that this term degenerates too, uh, too slowly at three. Um, Sorry, yeah, you were in the middle of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's just the simplicity of much of the equation is this. So we want to show boundedness, and the initial gauge normalization means that we know something about chi bar hat on this initial level surface here. So we just say, well, chi bar hat at this later time uv, it's equal to chi bar hat at zero plus the integral of alpha. So this is bounded by the initial normalization conditions. And this is bounded uniformly in U as a consequence of the analysis of the Tchaikovsky equation. So from this one can conclude boundedness of chi bar hat. Now, okay, we want to know whether chi bar hat decays, right? And in general, so as you take U to infinity, these two will not cancel. Okay. In general, these two terms do not cancel with one another. So this will be non-zero and this will be non-zero and the, the combination will also be non-zero. So it does not decay in this initial normalization. So what one does is normalizes, renormalizes the gauge to the future and then we revisit this equation. So remember, we think of the event horizon formally as being parameterized by U equals infinity. So chi bar at UV we write now is chi bar hat at the event horizon uh, plus or minus, minus the integral from u to infinity of alpha bar. Now, this 
normalization along the event horizon as assured that this is decaying as V goes to infinity. So this term is decaying. And the analysis of the Tchaikovsky equation means well, this term is certainly decaying as U goes to infinity. Okay. So then, type up. And then the boundedness of the pure gauge solution one has to add. This actually follows from the, the boundedness of the quantities in the initial normalization. So one, one adds a pure gauge solution to make something vanish on the event horizon. And when that something vanishes on the event horizon, the um, one can then infer the decay of other quantities along the event horizon. And you can think of that normalization as if we go back to that picture, uh, it's ensured that the, this figure to the future is, uh, is, is good. But this choice is made after, it's like between those two lines, basically. Correct. And, and that doesn't, it doesn't affect the, the bridge of Wheeler, or like it doesn't affect Right, anything. so I, I think you're on the room with us with this. So alpha and alpha bar are gauge invariant. And this means that they vanish for every pure gauge solution. Right? So one can study them independently of how this residual freedom is normalized. Uh, that's crucial, yeah. I see. Yeah, very nice. I was a bit worried that I didn't understand. I mean, I didn't understand. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions on Zoom or person? Well, if not, let's thank Martin for a beautiful second talk. We're really looking forward to tomorrow and uh, we'll, we'll see you all then.